Does this microphone work? It sounds like it does good. We'll see how long it works. It, when, once it stops working, I'm going to stop. So, good. Okay, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you especially for his presence here in the tabernacle, in the Most Holy Eucharist. I thank you for how he is present. So many people here have just gone to Mass, all those who have gone to Mass today. That he who has loved us to the end, he who has perfect joy, has put that joy into our hearts, that our joy may be complete. No one would take that joy away from us. Heavenly Father, please send forth that Holy Spirit. Renew our hearts. Teach us who you are. Teach us how you love us. Teach us who we are to you, that the joy of Jesus Christ may be within us, that the joy of Jesus Christ may be in each heart you have created, that we would live to the praise of your glory. Let us entrust ourselves and all of the graces of tonight through the intercession of Mary, our mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for coming out. This is, um, once I found out the, the sad news, I was coming up to, I mean, Jesus had three years on earth, so I was like, okay, three years of public ministry, I was like, that seems fitting. Um, I was like, I don't just want to shake hands and say goodbye. I want to, let's talk about Jesus Christ and how he loves us and say goodbye. That's what we're doing here today. So the, the four weeks, the title I've given to this is that your joy may be complete. So practically speaking, what we're going to do, we're going to have four lectures, today on the Father's love, next week on the Beatitudes, on June 7th on the Sacrament of Confession, and then finally on June 14th on Praise and Thanksgiving. I've named it that your joy may be complete, invoking Jesus' Last Supper discourse, but there's other possible names. It could have been named. Highlights from three years of trying to preach. Or the four long lectures behind many long homilies. Or if Father Joseph were forced to write a book, here are four proposals. Each lecture will essentially stand on its own, which means if you miss one, you won't... Like you can just come the next week and you won't, you, you, you won't be lost. It also means that if you have someone you know that should be coming to these, they won't feel lost if they come next week. Well, I can't promise that, but they shouldn't feel lost. They can feel how they feel. But this is an easy, if people can just come just to one, it works. Come to all four, it works. Okay? Um, and hopefully this is uh, obvious enough just to name it. I'm offering these four lectures as a thank you to the parish. Um, I, I really mean this literally. I hope you've seen me at the worst of my priesthood. I hope it only gets better. It's been the first three years. Young priests are really awkward, right? This is really strange from a priest. Uh, so you're going to meet some new priests in very few, very few days. So be, be prepared to help them learn how to like, walk in it. Um, and not only did we do that, we went through COVID together. Um, so we did a lot together. So, this is one big thank you. So, I know we just prayed. But let's pray again. We're going to start with this prayer from St. Paul. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, 
as you are being rooted and grounded in love, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. As with many of St. Paul's writings, there's a lot here. I highlighted what I want to focus on. So our task today, as best we can, and I should have warned you, I try to do 60-minute lectures, but some things happen, so just you can leave whenever you want to leave. But our goal tonight is at least to wade into the waters of this, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice what St. Paul's saying. This is something that surpasses knowledge, but we are to know it. A.K.A. Come Holy Spirit. This is going to be a, an act of a lot of faith here, to know something that's unknowable, right? Uh, that's, that's, what, that's the business of being a Catholic, the business of being a friend of Jesus Christ. And so uh, I have given you just eight pages so if this feels radically insufficient, that's a proper response, okay? Eight pages about something that surpasses knowledge. That being said, it's the most important thing to know, so it's worth trying. So let's just try together and see how far we get. And if, if you see anyone without a handout, please just like call them down, get a handout to them. Good. So one of the most basic acts of faith is that God loves you. Now, I hope that sounds really basic. You've heard that since kindergarten. You've heard it probably before kindergarten. Uh, but we're just going to unpack that three-word statement. Right? I give you here two quotations from, from St. John and St. Paul, just to sort of put the scripture on this, that we know and believe the love that God has for us. And I would say sometimes we know it, sometimes we believe it. We'll talk about that later, about sometimes faith is not always the prettiest thing, but it, it gets the job done. I'll explain what I mean later. And this great conviction St. Paul has, that God has poured into our hearts through the Holy God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Hope we're all in agreement on that. And I give you here just a quick list. Sometimes it's good when we talk about something so tremendous as God's love for us to name the specific moments of what we even are talking about, the concrete experiences. So I've given you a rather simple list here, everything from creation, incarnation of Jesus Christ, his suffering, death, and resurrection, Pentecost, and then personally, your baptism, your confirmation, each confession you ever go to, and each holy communion. Now, I say all of this as hopefully it's really obvious, I give you some scriptural quotes here just to put some more sort of scriptural meat on the bone so you can meditate. Like, okay, I know Jesus Christ loves me in the Eucharist, but let's feed that more. Um, and I, this, is, this, this is a list that is true for each one of us here. Um, and I hope you could add 25 more moments from your own personal life of when God has shown you that he loves you. That's a really, really important to be able to name those. And that's why like, we keep the memories of Mary on our belts. Just like, in case I ever forget who Jesus Christ is, I have 15 decades and 20, really, to meditate on. Just to go back to the events. I cannot deny that the Word became flesh. I cannot deny that he died for us, that he rose again. And so just as we carry his memories in the rosary, I think it's very important just for our own, our own relationship, our own friendship with Jesus Christ to be able to name the memories of when God showed his love for you. And even, if, at least if you're in my generation, put that on your Google calendar and have it repeat every year 
to remember, oh yeah, April 22nd, he did that thing, right? Um, maybe just a week ago, God gave you a reason that he obviously loves you, right? A reason that you can hold in your arms. So this is all review, so let's just keep jogging until we get to the stuff that may be not fully review. So the second page here. This is, again, I think really no surprises here, but it's worth saying it. So here are some important qualities of God's love. I'm putting it on just one side of paper, so there's a lot more to say, okay? So God's love is perfect, hopefully no surprise. It's perfect both in the sense that it's not missing anything, but it's also perfect in the sense of um, it's, it's complete, it's done. Think about if you ever learned a foreign language and the perfect verb tense, right? If it's a imperfect past verb, it's going, it was doing something. If it's a perfect verb, it's done, right? And this is very important because in human, in human loves, right, if I, if, even, even in the, the best situation, right, when a husband says to his wife, I love you, in the best context, that means I have loved you, I love you right now, and I promise to love you. And that's, that's the best we can do as humans. That's really good. We should be thankful for that. Sometimes I love you means things that are very much below that. When Jesus Christ says, I love you, it's not a promise. He's already done it. When he promises to die for you, it's not just a wish. He's actually accomplished it already. And that's just a radically different way of loving. God has already loved you perfectly it's not a question of whether he can do it or not, the way we could question a human if they say, I'm going to love you. Uh, it's just a matter of he's going to roll it out. He's already done it, and he's just going to give us, like the battle's won, it's just a matter of holding up the Stanley Cup and going around the ice celebrating, right? He's already loved us. God's love also includes perfect knowledge of you. Right, so we can only love what we know, and we know rather imperfectly. We even know ourselves imperfectly. God knows you through and through. I give you here just a few first verses of Psalm 139. That's a verse, just, that's a psalm just to really sit with. Right? That he knows you through and through. He knows every word on your tongue, even before you say it. What that means is that God can love you perfectly then because he knows you perfectly. Just, again, in human loves, there's two main fears. Maybe there's more, but two of the main fears are that no one could ever understand me. Especially when we've been through something rather traumatic or something just really difficult to share with someone. That sort of isolating fear. No one could ever understand me. But then on the other side, there's the fear if people knew the real me, they wouldn't love me, or even they couldn't love me. You can just think concretely about Adam and Eve right after they take the, uh, the forbidden fruit. Perhaps it was an apple, perhaps it was a fig, or something else. The first thing they do is they hide themselves from one another. They put on fig leaves. Uh, Eve is afraid if Adam sees the real me, he may not actually love me. It could be another response than love. And then when God, who absolutely loves them and for, can forgive everything and wants to forgive them, the first thing to do is hide from him. They hide from the very person, or the three persons in one substance, who can actually heal them. And that's just something that clings to us as fallen creatures, is the very moment we need someone to understand us and to love us and to bring healing, we look for shrubbery and we hide and we say, oh, no, no, I don't know, I'm not here. Don't look for me, God, right? And to really trust that when God knows you, when he sees you, it's with the tender gaze of a father who knows you. He knows you so that he can heal. He knows you so that he can love and cherish and delight in you. And to this, I would say, pray Psalm 103, that beautiful psalm of how the father loves us, how merciful he is to us, and how he understands our weakness and loves us all the same. 
In addition to this, God's love is eternal. God's love is beyond time. So God has loved you from before creation. St. Paul tells us before the foundation of the world, he chose you. God will always love you. God loved you when you were just one cell big in your mother's womb. Again, Psalm 139, that God knit you together in your mother's womb, and he only did that because he likes you. And God loves you right now, as you are, with all that's good about you, all that's awkward about you, all that needs to go to confession about you. He, he loves you as you are right now. Right? Sometimes we think he only loves the person I think I need to be, or the person he wants me to be, or the person I, you know, whatever it is. And God is a lot of things, but he's not hypothetical. He deals with concrete realities. And the concrete reality of who you are in this moment, that's the one whom he loves. He also knows who you will be in heaven. Now that's my hope, is that all of us will be in heaven. There are all other options, but I think all of us are on the right track here. Right? And he knows, he can already see you in your heavenly glory, and he loves you there too. Right? He sort of knows what, what the thing you'll be holding in heaven, that everyone will know, oh, he has a teapot, must be Father Joseph, or oh, he has this. Like, okay. Right? He knows what color hair you'll have. And how old we'll look in heaven? That's another question. Will we be in our 30s, our 20s? Will we just be like a couple months old? You know, how old will we be? God already knows, and he likes you. That's good to know. And the final thing on this page, at least, and there's probably a lot more to say, is that God love, God's love truly satisfies. Right? This is, again, something that distinguishes God's love from every other kind of love. This great promise he gives to the Samaritan woman that whoever drinks of the water, right, the Holy Spirit, faith, grace, he will never thirst. He can actually quench our hearts. That his, he makes our joy complete and that no one can take our joy away from us. That's later in John. He also just puts it this way, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Right? It's a different kind of fulfillment. The world can give us good things, and we should be thankful. But when God gives us something, it's complete. It satisfies. Now, again, all of this is rather insufficient for the reality we're talking about. And I hope all of it's review so far, but just a good sort of like pump-up talk about what we already know. Let's go into something that might be a little bit of a stretch. Um, we're going to talk about, and it's going to be two pages worth, and this is something you could write a whole book about. We're going to use this phrase called divine predilection. It's a really fancy way of something rather beautiful, but just give me a go here, okay? So to talk about something really intense, let's start with St. Therese. So St. Therese, this is the very, very beginning of Story of a Soul, the very beginning of her autobiography, Manuscript A. Right? I'll just read the highlighted here. So she's uh, as a very good nun, before she writes her biography, she opens up the Gospels and just at randomly picks a verse. And she says, Then opening the Holy Gospels, my eyes fell on these words. And going up a mountain, he, Jesus, called to him men of his own choosing, and they came to him. This is the mystery of my vocation, my whole life and especially the mystery of the privileges Jesus showered on my soul. He does not call those who are worthy, but those whom he pleases. Or as St. Paul says, God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and will show pity to whom he will show pity. So then there's no, a question not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God showing mercy. This gets to the question of why does God love us? And for Therese, it's not because she's worthy of it, but because God was pleased to do it. Just out of his good pleasure, God chose Therese, and he just freely delights in her. So we call this divine predilection, which is a very fancy way of saying that God's love 
precedes our holiness. God's love goes before our holiness. God's love makes us holy, not that our holiness makes God love us. So if you, are, if you like Latin, it's pre-election, right? So God's choice always comes before our choice. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And his love always comes before our love. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be expiation for our sins. And St. Therese, with that sort of, especially the gift of understanding from the Holy Spirit, goes right to the heart of it. The very first thing she writes about is this divine mystery predilection. And she says, this is the story of my life. And I would suggest that this is one of the most fundamental mysteries that God asks us to believe, that he chose to love you even before you had a chance to earn it. That your holiness is because he loves you. Everything good about you is something he already gave you. Right? So St. Thomas Aquinas puts it in a rather simple sentence with big words. Predestination, which is a good thing, we can talk about that later if you want, presupposes election in the order of reason, an election presupposes love. So, and to put it on the other way around, God's love is the foundation of why saints are elected and predestined for heaven. So, um, let's just go through these questions here. Why is Therese so holy? Well, it's because she loved much. That's holiness, is to love other people. And why does she love much? Well, because she was filled with the Holy Spirit, who is love. And why did the Holy Spirit fill her? Well, because she lived at the graces of her sacraments, right? Confirmation, baptism, confession, communion. And why did she live with those graces? Well, because she was given the grace of cooperation. And why did she receive that grace? Well, because God gave it to her. And well, why did God give it to her? Well, because he wanted to, essentially. God freely chose her. Right? Um, the, the sort of monopoly money of holiness is something God gives to us. It's not something we can just go back to him and be like, look, I have all this holiness. He's like, yeah, I gave it to you. Right? And if I give it, if I say, like, you should love me because I'm, because I'm all this, all these piles of holiness bills. He's like, I gave those to you because I love you, right? Have you been with me these so long and you do not yet understand? So let's put another really, uh, just for those of you who like St. Thomas Aquinas, let's read this paragraph. This is going to be a fun paragraph. It's going to sound really strange for 21st century English, but it's really worth it. So just, this is the one sort of Thomistic stretching the mind paragraph. Since to love anything is nothing else than to will good to that thing, it is manifest that God loves everything that exists, yet not as we love. Because since our will is not the cause of the goodness of things, but is moved by it and by its object, our love whereby we will good to anything is not the cause of its goodness. But conversely, its goodness, whether real or imaginary, calls forth our love, by which we will that it should preserve the good it has and receive besides the good it has not. And to this end, we direct our actions. Whereas the love of God infuses and creates goodness. If there's any one paragraph of St. Thomas Aquinas to really study, I would suggest this one. Let's break it down. So he's saying humans love differently than God. For humans, love is a response to something good. And in love, we choose to preserve its goodness and to increase it. You can think of a cute newborn baby. You say, that's a good, cute baby. I want to preserve that baby and give it what it needs, a.k.a. food, so that it can keep growing, right? You, you will its good to preserve and then for it to grow. And that's human love. God's love is different. It's not a response. It initiates. The love of God infuses and creates goodness. We'll put it simply in the next article. God's love is the cause of goodness in things. So if you have ten fingers, it's because God loves you. If when you breathe there's oxygen, it's because God loves you. If you still exist right now, it's because God loves you. Anything good you have is because God loves you. Now think what this means for us you know, on the receiving side. 
right? So if you want humans to love you, if you are freshman year of high school going into the lunchroom and you want someone to sit with you, right? You need to show that you're an attractive personality. You have an interesting thing to talk about. You have lunch things you want to trade, whatever it is, right? That freshman year of high school, I need to impress people kind of thing that some of us still live with for even to adulthood, right? But that sort of like, if you want someone to love you, you have to show, right? Now there's a sinful way of doing that, but there's also just like, if you go on a date, you should look good, right? You should shower, you soap, right? Like, like so there's like, like a proper way of showing your goodness so that other people can love you. And that's how humans work. Right? Sometimes it's how humans don't work, but that's another story. Right? We're trying to show our goodness so as to call forth love from others. But if we try this with God, we will utterly fail. Because to try it with God well, is to not know who he is, which is a very insulting thing to do to someone. Right? Imagine if someone were to give you $2 million and they just put it in your bank account. Right? And then you go to them, and you're like, please give me 20 bucks, you never give me any money. It's actually like rather rude to ask 20 bucks from someone who's giving you 2 million bucks and you haven't used it yet. God has already loved you, and yet we still cry out, why don't you love me enough, right? Now, that being said, he'll still play ball with us. He'll still sort of love us, even when we're being a teenager, right? Teenagers say, you never loved me, right? Um, and perhaps it's true for some parents, but not true for God. So God already knows our goodness. We can't sort of like surprise him how good we are. We can't give him a bill of our goodness and say, you owe me, right? As St. Paul puts the Corinthians, what have you that you did not receive? Or as he tells the Ephesians, you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So God delights in us like an artist beholding his artwork. Right? Michelangelo made good art, and he liked it. And if Michelangelo makes good art, what about God? You're his artwork. He evidently likes you. Or think about a parent looking upon a child. Right? It's just very simple. You love your child. Right? So our role is not to earn God's love, but to believe in it, to trust it, to praise and thank him, and to return love for love. So sometimes when we get so caught up in the cycle of trying to earn God's love, we're missing our actual job description in life, which is to say thank you and to believe in the love. So St. Thomas Aquinas gives us the meat of the mystery, but sometimes it's helpful to go to St. John Paul II to talk about how this is lived out. He's a good sort of, if you ever read St. Thomas, read some St. John Paul II. That sort of helps. Um, that's, how, that's how I got through my studies. Um, so he fleshes this out in this beautiful document, Meditation on Givenness. Oh, we're doing well with time. Let's, let's just read the whole thing together. Love has many facets. It seems that the first of these is a disinterested. Disinterested does not mean uninterested. It just means not being selfish about it, okay? Disinterested predilection, partiality, or liking. Amor complacentiae. God, who is love, bestows this form of love above all others, above all of the forms upon man, men and women, a loving predilection. The eyes of the creator, though embracing the whole created universe, rest especially on man, who is the object of his special liking. They rest on both man and woman as he created them. Perhaps this is why Genesis emphasizes that they were both naked and felt no shame. Elsewhere, the author of the letter of the Hebrews writes, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom, we have, with whom we have to do. God embraces man and woman in the whole truth of their humanity. He rests his creative and fatherly favor, predilection, in this truth. He grafts this disinterested liking, this predilection into their hearts. He makes them capable of mutual love, of a liking for one another. In man's eyes, the woman is a special synthesis of the beauty of all creation, and he too simile in her eyes. Their nakedness is no, no way a source of shame. It is deeply transformed by the love the Creator has for them. One can speak here of a certain special absorption of shame by love, this time by the love of God himself. 
So, a couple takeaway points. Well, we talk about divine predilection. It amounts to God loves you because he likes you. Sometimes we use the word like in the sense of, like when you're like in fifth grade and there's a girl, and it's like, does she like me, like, like me, or love me? Like is sort of seen as like a half way of loving. But here what we mean by liking, right, so we're supposed to love everyone, even to love our enemies. We're not expected to like everyone, right? So liking is not only to will the good for someone else, but to actually think they have a nice nose, to like their personality, to want to be in their company, right? So God loves you because he wants your company. That's another way to put this. And if you ask why he likes you, well, the answer is simply because, well, he likes to like you. It's just going to be an infinite regression of liking, right? That's why it's, this is one of the key acts of faith. Because if you're not willing to accept that God loves you simply because he wants to, there's no other way to, to really start. That's, that's the beginning. That's the first domino in many ways. So this predilection is his fatherly favor. So think of a father who attends his daughter's high school piano recital. He has already bought roses, and he's already convinced that his daughter is the best, even before she performs. In an even more excellent way, our Heavenly Father, he's already bought the roses. Like your heavenly crown of glory has already been purchased by the blood of Christ. He already knows you're going to do it because he's going to make you do it. That's grace another topic of conversation. And he's just waiting, waiting to crown you, waiting to love you, right? And it's also interesting, too, I think John Paul points out something very important, that the Father's predilection absorbs our shame and transforms it. I think it's when we feel shame, that shame kind of freezes our hearts and makes us think that we're unlovable, that's when we need to go to the one who is really good at loving, and that's our Father, our Son, the Holy Spirit. Right. We'll talk about this later in the third week about confession, but this is like, when it comes to confession, you don't need to prove to God that you're worthy of being forgiven. Like, he wants to forgive you, right? And that's why confession is such a powerful way for like the wounds of Christ that love us with such predilection just to draw out all of that sort of poisonous shame that would freeze our hearts against receiving any love. Just to experience a love that's purely predilection. A father who's already just like, he's God basically biased for us. He already thinks that you're the best in, in, you know, in, a, in a certain way of speaking. Good. Okay, now I want to give you three objections to all of this, okay? So the first objection, which I think most of us experience at least once in our life, if not every day, is sin. I'm a sinner. How could God love me? Like, this is all nice, Father Joseph. Of course God likes people in this, but that's for the, the saints. Uh, what about me who sin, right? The scripture's very clear that God hates sin. He wants to punish sinners. Fire and brimstone. Read the Psalms. So, like, this would all apply to me if it weren't for me being such a bad person, right? And even if we sort of know, okay, something's wrong there, we feel this one. I think we all feel this, at least in different seasons of our lives, where all the promises of God's love is, is nice, but it's not for me, right? So, First response is that God's love is greater than all sin. God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Or St. Paul says again, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I think one really big temptation Usually when we use, use the word temptation, we mean like something that's going to be so um, fun or pleasurable that we're breaking rules. But the real temptation with sin is to think that sin gets the final say in who we are 
that sin has the authority in our life. Which is rather understandable, because if it's just me versus sin, it's going to kick me in the butt five times a day. Or if it's just me versus my bad habits, even if I have a good stretch of time, it's going to get one in on me. Right? Sin, if it's just me versus sin, sin's probably going to win. Right? But God, well, he exists. That's the important thing. And he has all authority, all power, all honor, all kingship belong to him. And so to believe that God has the authority, not sin. God has the authority to say who you are, not sin. Now, sin is part of our story. I'm not saying sin's nothing. And sin has consequences. But God has the final say. The pen writing the story of your life is always in God's hands. And even what we did to Jesus Christ, the greatest sin of humanity, it became the most beautiful thing. God can take the wounds of Christ and make them fountains of mercy. Right? So the first is have that faith. God's love for me is greater than my sin. When God looks upon me, he does not see just a sinner. He sees the prodigal son he's bringing back home. The prodigal daughter he's bringing back home. To put a little bit of theology on this, to know that, um, well, God, what's the emotional life of God like? So God simply loves and a love that gives him joy, that gives him delight. And that's who he is, 100% of the time, always loving. So when St. Thomas talks about this, he then has to deal with the fact that Scripture often talks about God's anger and God's sadness. Right? And that's something that we have to think about too. So I'm giving you some big, clunky theological truths here, but you can handle it. So essentially... For St. Thomas Aquinas, and I think he's trustworthy in this one, that when God, when Scripture speaks about God's sorrow or God's anger, how he hates sin, how he hates, uh, how he, you know, um, it's a metaphor, a very important metaphor, not the same metaphor as in forget about it, but it's not, he doesn't actually feel anger, as if he has to, like, walk, laps around heaven and calm down, Right? So he's not feeling anger the way we feel anger. Rather, if you follow here. So he gives the principle here that certain human passions are predicated of the Godhead metaphorically, aka like anger, sadness. This is done because of a likeness in the effect. Hence, a thing that is in us a sign of some passion is signified metaphorically in God under the name of that passion. That's a really fancy way of saying God always loves, but sometimes that love has the effect of what we would see as sadness or we would see as anger. So let's, let's see what he says here. So talking about sorrow, St. Thomas says that to sorrow, therefore, over the misery of others belongs not to God. So properly speaking, your sins do not make God sad, right? That's, that's a metaphorical expression that it makes him sad. And it's worth saying, we'll talk about that, but it's not like he's up there with Kleenex, saying, I can't believe they did that, right? Rather, God, out of love, dispels our misery, right? So, like, if someone's having a tough day and I'm sad with them, it's because I want to sort of help them manage their sadness. I want them to, to sort of cry it out and sort of feel loved. God does that, but not with having to cry with us. He's perfectly, in, perfectly filled with love and peace and joy. And from that, from his love, he takes away our misery. Okay? And then also with anger. So anger signifies that God punishes evil. But he doesn't punish evil from, again, a hatred of who we are, but rather from a love. I think this is very clear. Think about parents. Like when a kid runs into the street, especially in Manhattan, um, he needs to be taught not to run into the street for obvious reasons, right? But that can either come from a place of love or it can come from a place of just absolute frustration, right? Now, sometimes there's a little bit of a mix because every parent is like not fully, fully awake, right? There's a mix there. 
right, with God is simply from love. That if he's punishing me, he's also loving me. It's the same thing for God. Okay? Therese actually has a really important expression in her autobiography about this. She's on retreat as a Franciscan recollect priest who's giving a retreat at her Carmel, and she goes to confession with him, and she said she, before going to confession, she had all of these troubles and just this weight on her soul, and then when she went into confessional, she felt so understood that her heart opened. And he says, the priest told me that my faults caused God no pain, and that holding as he did God's place, he was telling me in his name that God was very much pleased with me, Oh, how happy I was to hear those consoling words. My nature was such that fear made me recoil. With love, not only did I advance, I actually flew. So some people, it does help some people to use the metaphorical language of sadness and anger. Right? Some people, it gets them, it awakens them when they realize that God loves you and he's angry with you. Right? Now, love you is properly speaking, is angry with you is metaphorically speaking, but sometimes that gets people to go to confession. If that gets them to go to confession, okay, let's do it. But for others, like St. Therese, it just makes her freeze and just like not want to trust him, right? And this was huge in 19th century France, right? They just went through wave after wave of revolutions, and so it's kind of like maybe God does hate us. Like, we did a lot of terrible things as a country, right? And to sort of hear all the Jansenism going around. And just to hear the Franciscan priest say, uh, your sins cannot cause God pain. He simply loves you. Gave her that freedom to know the heart of her father. So another way to put this is divine predilection is immutable. A really fancy way of saying God likes you and he doesn't change. So he always likes you. One thing to think about practically here is a common thing for people who come to parish studies and daily mass is that when you're going through a tough time, you think, I'm suffering, I'm a sinner, at least I've had a very sinful past, therefore God must be punishing me for my past. Right? I, like, I deserve this, so, okay, I, I, like, I probably shouldn't be happy because of how bad of a person I am. Now, there is a sense that God could be doing something remedial in sending purifications your way. Um, but I think the one way to put this is God is not treating you like sinners when you suffer. He's treating you like sons and daughters. This beautiful expression from Hebrews chapter 12, it's a whole couple paragraphs, but just one sort of quote here. Saint, well, I think St. Paul, but someone said, "'Endure trials for the sake of discipline.'" God is treating you as children, for what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? Or even more, to see that when we are going through trials, it's because we've picked Jesus Christ as a friend, and he wants to share everything with you. So St. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. So yes, we are sinners, and yes, we will suffer, but it's not just because we're sinners. It's because we are children of the Father, and he knows what's best for us. Now, I'm not, I wouldn't say that to someone going through suffering right now, like, God knows what's best for you, so, like, come on, get better. But for us who are hopefully in a period of a little bit of peace, right, to know that this is God, God is treating you as he loves you still. That's the point here, right? And you're a friend of Jesus Christ. And to see it, even as sharing in that friendship. There's another quote from St. Therese I didn't have time to put on. It's from her last conversation. So she's on her deathbed, uh, and she's talking to one of her sisters. I want to say Celine. I could be wrong. And Celine is admitting, like, she had a fault, and she's feeling all guilt about her fault. And just like, oh, woe is me. Something like that. I might be making up a little bit, but go with me there. Right? Um, and St. Therese tells her sister, that what she does, St. Therese, when she commits a fault and she suffers because of it, right? If you do something, right, you break something, everyone knows you broke it. You're like, oh, you know, criminy, right? Um, 
she says that she offers that pain, that's her own fault, she offers that pain as if it was like her penance that day, she offers it to God, as if it was something that came from fasting or prayer or almsgiving. So that even, right, so the usual example I give with RCIA, right, I, um, late, later tonight I'm going to sort of binge on brie cheese and eat, eat a whole wheel of brie cheese and commit a big sin of gluttony just because I want to, right? And then I'm going to feel so terrible for the next, like, 6 to 12 hours, right? And I'm feeling terrible because I'm a sinner. That's a really clear connection between my sin of overeating brie cheese and then indigestion for, you know, how long it takes, Right? But what St. Therese is saying, well, you can just offer that indigestion as if this is the cross God's asking you to carry. Right? So if you feel terrible after a sin, well, pretend you're feeling terrible after a day of fasting. Just offer to God. God, I offer this suffering. It's my own fault, certainly, Father. But even this I offer to you because I know you are a Father who loves me. And also the final response to this objection is just a real confidence that Jesus seems to like sinners, right? He's kind of bored with self-righteous people. I think they're really boring too. He just loves sinners, right? So at least read Luke 7, the end of Luke 7, right? The Simon the Pharisee, who's a really boring person, and then the woman, who's anything but boring, and just crying all over his feet. It's very clear who Jesus likes and who he's just sort of like being nice with, right? Good. Yeah. Okay, next objection. Divine predilection sounds nice, but kind of selfish. Kind of like you're a little child and like, don't we need responsible people in the church and not just like little brats essentially, right? Because holiness for, consists in forgetting oneself and even hating oneself, right? So what are we supposed to do with all of this? Well, there is something true here. So at the fundamental level of our discipleship, our friendship with Jesus Christ, is a movement from being preoccupied with myself and then being preoccupied with God, with loving him, praising him, adoring him, loving neighbors because he loves them, right? That's like, that's a really fundamental movement. And he uses strong language, right? Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own mother and father, father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that's hyperbole, right? He does not actually want us to hate our mother and our father, let alone our wife, right? That's like, that'd be a terrible wedding reading, right? Um, But rather he's saying, I must be your number one. And if anything gets in the way of that, it's just not going to work for you. You're going to be miserable, right? I think one thing that's going on here is a kind of humility that God has made us for himself. He did not make us to be fully independent. We need him to love us. We need him just the way the, little, the smallest child in the family needs its parents. We need him for everything. Right. And so sometimes our refusal to let God love us is from a pride that doesn't want to accept how creaturely we are, right? I, you hear this, well, you don't hear this, I hear this, and sometimes people leave the confessional saying, like, they, they apologize for coming to confession as if this, like, is an imposition on God, and I'll try my best not to, like, come back here ever again, I'll be good. It's like, no, like, God loves you. <laughs> like, he, he doesn't want, he's not like, oh, I, I have to forgive that person again. I have to love that person even more. Like, shouldn't you be mature enough not to need me? Right? Like, we really need him, and that's actually part of loving. Right? The issue is if we bring that need for God to another person who is, isn't God, that's going to go poorly. Right? One way to understand this is to think about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus teaches us to first seek the praise of God, right? Hallowed be thy name, sanctificado sea tu nombre, his kingdom and his will. But he also teaches us to pray for our needs, for our daily bread, for forgiveness, protection, deliverance. And that's very instructive. He wants us to, the first thing we're going to seek is for his name to be hallowed. But we also need to ask him for our bread. Right? 
So, going to St. Thomas, we need to pray to God, not in order to make known to him our needs or desires, but that we ourselves may be reminded of the necessity of having recourse to God's help in these matters, to recognize how much we need him. That's why you have to pray. He even says, St. Thomas goes on here, God bestows many things on us out of his liberality, generosity is another word, even without our asking for them. But that he wishes to bestow certain things on us at our asking is for, our own, for the sake of our own good, namely, that we may acquire confidence in having recourse to God, that we may recognize him the author of our goods. Right? So that we are to be asking God to love us, asking for his good things, so that we can say, God, these all came from you. They're not from me, they're gifts from you. I thank you, I trust you, I praise you. Right? One other response to this objection is just the story of St. Therese. Most people, or at least a lot of people, when the first time you read the autobiography, which if you haven't, you should, the first reaction a lot of people have is that she's a spoiled little girl who's such a youngest child and it's just annoying, especially anyone who's not a youngest child. It's just like, oh my, she's a saint, right? Like, she's like all about herself. Now, my pet theory is that she purposely wants you to know how unworthy of God's love she is. So she's purposely, as St. Paul puts 2 Corinthians 11, boasting of all that shows her weakness. She's not trying to convince you that she's holy. She's trying to convince you God could work with her, even though she wasn't holy. But then if you read the end of her biography, if you read manuscript C, like the last two chapters, she talks about how much she loves her sisters in the convent. And if you read that, at least if, when I read it, I'm terribly humbled. Because I think I'm a decently loving person, but compared to her, I'm a real selfish jerk. Right? So she purposely seeks out the sisters that no one wants to be with, and she befriends them. The one sister that no one likes, she smiles at with such a smile that that sister thinks that they're super good friends, right? She shows just this, essentially like a motherly love. Like, I don't expect to get anything from you, but I'm happy anything I get from you, but I'm not gonna like demand anything from you. I'm just gonna give you love upon love upon love upon love upon love, right? And so connect those dots. What begins by looking rather really, really selfish, in the end produces a saint who is so selfless, it's actually kind of scary. And I think there's a wisdom in that. That on one hand, we are sons and daughters before the Father. And before the Father, we're just his little one. We have to expect everything from him. And we're like little children who just cry with immediate needs, and when I need something, I need it right now, right? Babies don't have snooze buttons. Like, if, they, if they're hungry, they need to be fed within about five minutes before the next round of crying goes to, like, extreme level crying, right? But then when I'm in front of others, I am then to, to be sort of a brotherly figure, a sisterly figure, or even sometimes a fatherly figure or a motherly figure. And I think our lives need to have a balance of both of those times when we're just that little child in the presence of the Father, letting him spoil us in the good sense of spoiling, and then times when we are that father, that mother, who is just loving people who are annoying and irritating. We don't tell them that they're annoying and irritating. We tell them that God loves them, and we really do it, right? I also give you here this quote from St. Elizabeth of Trinity, a letter she wrote right before her death. And the whole letter is this, this ongoing exhortation, let yourself be loved. So let's read this little bit. Let yourself be loved more than these. It is in that way that your master wills for you to be a praise of glory. He rejoices to build up in you by his love and for his glory. And it is he alone who wants to work in you, even though you will have done nothing to attract this grace. That's divine predilection except that which a creature can do, works of sin and misery. Be the squeaky wheel, you get more oil. He loves you like that. He loves you more than these. Now, to save paper, I gave you just a few sentences. I recommend finding that. If you, it's St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, Collected Works, Volume 1, but I can print it off for you if you want. Just let me know. Good. 
Okay, the final objection, and we might even end close to on time, but don't expect that next week, and we're gonna keep going along. So third objection, divine predilection, and just in total, God's love for me, sounds nice, but unreal. It may make theological sense, but I don't experience it. I mainly experience silence and suffering. If God really likes me like that, you gotta put your hand on your hip. If God really likes me like that, maybe he should show it a bit more if he expects me to believe it. I think that kind of hits home every now and then. So, the first thing to say is that, as we said at the beginning, we are to, we're about, we're trying to know something that surpasses knowledge, which means that we know this by faith. And faith is not something you can just download. It's not something you can just read enough books or just pray enough rosaries. Now, those are all good things, right? Pray rosaries, read good books. But that in itself, only God gives faith, right? So as creatures, we need experiential knowledge to grasp things viscerally. Purely intellectual knowledge often does not satisfy, right? especially when it comes to love, right? Um, a wife may know intellectually that her husband loves her, but she wants to have some experience of it at least a few times a month, right? Just something where you're like, oh yes, he does love me, right? And so, but our knowledge from, of God comes through faith. And faith is not always accompanied by experience, especially when we're going through trials. We may not experience it. St. Paul tells us, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, no voice, no human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. That sounds really nice, but sometimes we wish our eyes could see it and our ears could hear it because that would help us a bit, right? So we say, no, it's so good, you just can't experience it yet. It's like, oh, well, just give me an appetizer, right? So faith, we call it this the obscurity of faith. In heaven we will see clearly, like in daylight. In this life, faith is our flashlight. It shows things, but what a flashlight shows. It doesn't show the whole thing, and it's still kind of blurry, right? So again, St. Paul says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have fully known. And this, is, this is what the Carmelites talk about, the dark night of the senses, the dark night of the soul, I'll give you just a simple paragraph from the Catechism to summarize this. Right, there's this, this moment of sheer faith clinging to Jesus Christ. And so this obscurity purifies our faith so that, right, so faith in its height, so these are three sort of ways that we're supposed to have purified faith, that I would embrace and obey all the church's teaching on faith and morals I do not pick and choose. I do not sit as a pretended judge over the church's teachings, as if they were proposals that require my ratification. Rather, I'm a spiritual child, docile to Mother Church, and I assent to the teaching of God and his church even when I don't experience it or feel it. I believe even when I don't see. I even believe in God's unfelt love for me, a sinner, a repentant sinner, hopefully. Now that's, th that's not solving the problem, I'm just naming the problem, right? That our faith is obscure, and so our faith that God loves me is not always going to, I'm not always going to see it in broad daylight. But this is not complete blindness. God still reveals himself in various ways. So I give you just here the quick list, right? Sacraments, scripture, fellowship, your own personal prayer. So certainly, in all seasons, we should be doing all four of those, and we could add to that list. And there's going to be seasons that even when we do those, we're not going to feel it. But there's a big difference between not feeling God's love and staying isolated in my own little world versus not feeling God's love but still going to Mass and receiving communion, still praying my rosary every day, still engaging in fellowship. Even if I don't feel it, there's still a real love happening. When you receive communion, He really loves you, even if you don't feel it. But if I think, uh, I don't feel it, I'm just going to stay home, that's it's not going to really, in, at least in that moment, it's not going to help, right? 
One thing to also understand here, and this is something that took me a long time as an Irish American man to believe, but that God's love welcomes your honest lament. So you can dish it out to him. The Psalms, in a special way, teach us how to dish it out to God, how to lament honestly. I'll give you three examples here. So these three examples have half of the quote is a really theologically incorrect statement about why do you not love me anymore. And you could just give them a book about why God still loves you, but God is okay hearing it. And then in the same psalm, they'll say the very opposite thing, right? So Psalm 22, which is very famous, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? The words of my groaning. Yet later on, he says, for he did not despise or pour the affliction of the afflicted, he did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. Always read the whole psalm. That's one takeaway from that. Or Psalm 42. This starts with the good part and then goes to the bad part. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Or Psalm 77. Has his steadfast love ceased forever? Are his promises to an end for all time? But later on, the psalmist says, I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. Those are just three examples, but the psalms really teach us that one of the best ways to manage feeling that God's far from you is to tell God, I think you're far from me. Because the very fact that you're using the second person means that you believe that he can hear you, but you're still going to like let it out. Right? There's something to that. But I would recommend always using the Psalms, because you know if you use the Psalms, you're in the right path. If you start dishing out to God without the Psalms, you could go strange places. Okay? Good. So on the last page, I give you one way to understand silence in prayer, which is one of the main ways we can feel unloved. So with humans, silence is very ambiguous, and silence is often bad. Again, an Irish-American household, I understand this, right? So sometimes there's the awkward silence of you don't know someone, like there's a stranger in the house, and so no one talks, right? Or there's this silence of disappointment, which is like just really heartbreaking, right? The silence of withholding. Someone has something important to say. They don't trust you, so they're just not going to say anything. Or the silence of being uninterested, right? Somehow watching baseball on TV. I think baseball in person is really good, but baseball on TV is somehow more interesting than talking to a living person. Or even just like looking at my phone is more interesting than talking to an actual human person. Or even more crushing of all, the silence of abandonment. This is that he, he's not there. These are all things that we experience, all things we experience with humans, and some of these are the most heartbreaking experiences we have with humans. And then when God is silent with us, it's very easy just to take that experience and create God in our own image and likeness and say, you must be doing this to me. It's not, it's not my first rodeo. I know what you're doing. I'm not happy with it. So for each one of these, I give you a quote from Scripture to sort of help you uh, put the truth in. Right? That God is not awkward with you. He knows you. He's not disappointed with you. Again, predilection. This beautiful line, um, it was not because you were the most, more numerous than all of the people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you if you ever feel unlovable by God, read the Old Testament. Because they are the chosen people, and they did everything they could to try not to be chosen. Right? Like, they did worse sins than the Gentiles. And God was like, ah, still my chosen people. Right? Uh, and that's just like, there's a reason, just the way St. Therese sort of lets her dirty laundry out, the Old Testament is full of dirty laundry, every book. And it's like, okay, if God can love David after a couple of things, maybe he can love me too. Right? The science of withholding, that Jesus says, I have made known, I have called you friends, I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. 
He's not withholding from us. He even gives us the Holy Spirit. He's not uninterested, right? Look at the crucifix if you think he's uninterested. And he, like, the abandonment, again, like, we can feel it, but just know when you're dealing with someone who's omnipresent, he couldn't abandon you if you wanted to, right? If God was like, I really want a vacation from this person, where would he go? Like, how do you get away from someone when you're everywhere all the time, right? Now, that's an intellectual argument. You need more than just that to actually believe it. But again, that Psalm 139, even if I go into the darkness, dark, the night, night is not dark for you, right? Even if I go to the first limbs of the sea, even there your hand should lead me. Or Isaiah 49, that even if a mother could forget, I will never forget you. Right? I have inscribed your name on the palms of my hands. So in replacement of these, let me just give you four examples of how to understand God's silence when he's loving you. So first, this wasn't on purpose, but God's silence is like a silence of a mother carrying her sleeping infant, just giving him rest. Certainly babies, when they're awake, are cute. But there's a particular cuteness when they're sleeping, right? There's just a peace. Just think about Silent Night, that beautiful Christmas carol. This is actually a struggle for many newborn parents, parents of newborns, that they're supposed to sleep when their child sleeps, but they're so, so cute when they're sleeping, there's a temptation just not to sleep at all, right? Because um, they're not going to cry, they're not going to fuss, they're going to make weird movements with their mouth, right? They're going to, like, shiver a little bit. Um, to know that that's how kind of God loves you. Sometimes he just wants you to rest. He's not going to disturb you. He just wants you to rest. God's silence is also like the silence of a friend who listens intently, who does not interrupt. So many times people have very deep experiences they need to share with someone and they get like 10% into sharing the experience and the friend interrupts out of a sense of wanting to be a good listener, offer them some suggestions, sort of talk about, oh, I've had that experience too when I did this. And then that 100% is just left to like 10%, right? If you come in here and tell Jesus Christ what's on your heart, I give you a 99% guarantee he will not interrupt you. He will hear you all the way out. Try this with someone. If someone's having a tough day and they share with you the first paragraph, there's usually a second paragraph. And if you just give them five seconds, not of awkward silence, but of very attentive silence, you may find, and they may even be surprised, that there's a second paragraph that comes out. And I've never shared with anyone, but this is what's happening, right? God does that with us all the time. He's like, oh, no, no, I know that's important to you, but you still haven't told me the whole story, so I'm going to wait. It's a silence that's listening to you. It's also the silence of simply the lover who delights. Here, I'm thinking about, like, my two grandparents. They both have passed away, but how they ate breakfast together, and they loved each other. They were married for over 50 years, but they didn't always talk at the breakfast table. Right? It wasn't like they were, like, sort of looking at other things. They just sort of had a peace about them. They sort of knew each other so well, they didn't need to talk. They sort of knew they were, they were with each other and that they have 50 years of marriage together. They got through World War II. They got through nine kids, 26 grandkids. There's not much more to talk about. They've done it all, right? And just being with each other. Just that simple delight. The final one is that God's silence is a silence of the friend you don't need to impress. When you're praying, you don't need to give your resume to God. You don't need to prove to him that he should be paying attention to you, right? And we, we're aware of this in conversations. Like, that's just that, like, I'm only going to tell the story if it's a really good story. I'm going to make sure it sounds really good, and I want people to be impressed with the story, and all that sort of, like, and that's, like, okay, that's, like, how human relationships work. With God, he's already impressed with you. And he just wants to be with you. And so his silence is saying, look, you can talk, you don't have to talk, I'm just here with you. Like, let's just be together. It's a silence that says, let's just relax. Good. If you want to pray about silence, Psalm 62, Psalm 131, or Matthew 11 are good places to go.
And I stole this all from a book, so go to that book if you want to see more of it. One final thing is just um, a sort of imperative to go out and preach. That if God remains silent and faith is sometimes obscure, then it's the duty of Christians to proclaim the love of God and to exemplify it. Like this call from St. Paul, how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have not yet heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? So all of us have some experience of the love of God. That's why we're here. And there are many people outside these walls that have very few experience of God's love or experience that they don't know how to name yet. It's kind of our duty to proclaim to them the love of Christ, to teach them his love, well, it's worth it. So let's end again with that prayer from St. Paul. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord be with you. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thank you for coming.